I'm Victor Mendoza. I am a faculty at um, Women's Studies and English and uh, faculty affiliate in, in American Culture and a Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And I'm here to introduce uh, Kale Fajardo uh, today. Uh, Kale um, Fajardo is a, an associate professor of American Studies and Asian American Studies at the University of Minnesota, the other U of M. Twin Cities. Uh, he's also uh, an affiliate faculty member of the Gender and Women's and Sexuality Studies Department, uh, which goes by GWIZ, which is <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, his first book is entitled Filipino Cross Currents, and I have a fresh copy here for you to sign, please, afterwards. Uh, Filipino Seafaring Masculinities and Globalization, and that came out with the University of Minnesota Press uh, in 2011 and 13. Oh, uh, Philippines, University of Philippines Press in 2013. Uh, he just published an essay entitled uh, Queering and Transing the Great Lakes, which can be found in the GLQ special edition on Queering the Middle, which is about the Midwest, uh, race, sexual diasporas in the queer Midwest. He also has a forthcoming essay in Filipino Palimpsest and Filipino Studies in the 21st Century, edited by Martin Manalansan and Augusto Espiritu, uh, both at the University of Illinois. His essay in that volume is titled Decolonizing St. Malo, Louisiana, and it's coming out with uh, New York University Press in a year or so. Uh, Professor Fajardo divides his time between Minneapolis, uh, Austin, Texas, Portland, Oregon, as well as Malolos, Bulacan. And as you know, his talk today focuses on some of the research he's done in his hometown in the Philippines. And I just want to say, as, um, as a side note, I, I'm first saw uh, Kale talk at, um, I think, uh, Association for Asian American Studies, maybe in 2008, when uh, a formative essay uh, came out in GLQ on, um, on trans um, and uh, tomboy masculinities in, in the Philippine diaspora. His field work is astonishing. I don't know how anyone can do that kind of work on, uh, on uh, seafaring transportation vessels, so I'm sure he would be happy to <laughs> talk about that work too. Um, but this is a new project and I'm really, really excited about it. Okay, thank you, Professor Fajardo. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for coming to my talk. Um, I know this is a really busy time of the year, so I definitely appreciate everyone's um, presence and attention, and um, I really look forward to hearing your feedback. Um, I want to thank Victor Mendoza for inviting me, as well as for the Center uh, for Southeast Asian Studies here at the Other M. Um, <laughs> and uh, also to Nayiri uh, Molinex, who helped me with my air, um, airline ticket and also accommodations and logistics. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my talk today is very much a work in progress. As uh, Victor kind of alluded, my past research that I've been doing since, you know, around the mid-90s has really been uh, focusing on gender and masculinity studies and queer studies with a feminist and post-colonial perspective. And I'm bringing those things into this project, but I really don't have um, an extensive background in cultural heritage preservation. And I'll sort of tell you how I got involved in this, but so it is very much a new field of study. And um, so I'm still learning about some of the discourse and some of the politics of doing cultural heritage preservation. And so I'm definitely open to hearing, you know, questions, feedback, and critique to help me kind of um, guide this a little bit. And I'm also not sure if I'm going to turn this into a larger manuscript. Um, and I'll sort of talk about some of the interesting kind of, um, not messiness, but the complexities of doing field work in one's hometown and what has sort of um, emerged from that and so is making me wonder if I do want to pursue this more um, on a more personal level and less kind of as a professional um, academic um, project. So the first thing I wanted to do is just introduce the project. So why did I begin uh, this work? Uh, the first thing is that, as Victor mentioned, 
Um, my first book was on Filipino seafaring masculinities and globalization. And as a grad student um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, in the cultural anthropology department, uh, in the 90s, uh, when globalization and critiques of e economic and neoliberal globalization uh, were sort of unfolding, I took on a very ambitious project that was very global, right? So I'm taking, I'm examining some of the politics of the global shipping industry, and I did transnational work in Manila and the Port of Oakland. And I think after working on that for, you know, over 10 years, I wanted something that literally kind of anchored me to a space and place. And so I really started thinking more locally, even though, as we all know, those categories are very fluid and there are global aspects and local contexts and, um, you know, a sense of location and placeness within a global framework, right? But I think that that was part of my thinking and um, motivation and desire to kind of work on a smaller scale after doing such a larger project. Um, secondly, as uh, Victor mentioned, um, I am from Malolos. I was born there, and uh, my family migrated to the United States um, in the early 70s. And so I was four and a half years old when I uh, moved, my family moved to Portland, Oregon. And so I write a little bit about my family history in my first book. And so um, my, you know, extended family is pretty much rooted in Malolos. Both my parents are from there. Um, they, at different points in their careers, both of them were teachers at Marcelo del Pilar High School. Um, my grandparents are there, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that history. And um, I also want to just dedicate uh, this talk and the project to my mother who passed away um, on December 1st in 2013. And I get a lot of my love of both the Philippines and Malolos from my, um, my parents and especially my mother. So this is definitely a, a very personal project for me and um, I'll try not to cry through throughout my talk, but I definitely am feeling my mom today and I just actually posted that on Facebook. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit, about, there's a little section where I get slightly auto-ethnographic. Um, I'm, I'm not going to start off with that, um, but I will talk a little bit about how my family is implicated um, in the project. Uh, so one of the things as I was trying to think about second and third projects after uh, my book was published and after I received tenure, uh, you know, I started doing research and thinking about, okay, I want to do this more localized project. And um, Malolos has been a place that I've always returned to. And as my book, my first book sort of documents, um, I really have a very transnational sensibility. I was fortunate enough to have parents who, although I immigrated at the age of four and a half, we kept our connections and our ties and we traveled to the Philippines on a fairly regular basis as much as you could as sort of um, working people in the United States with, you know, three children and the expenses and, but we managed to go home for different family events. Um, I also studied for a semester in Manila during my undergraduate um, and took a break from where I was doing my undergraduate studies at Cornell. And that also solidified um, my interests. And basically, those experiences um, shaped my, you know, my identity and my commitment to Philippine studies and Filipino diaspora studies. Um, so I'm trying to find a research project. I'm kind of just Googling around, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Malolos's history, but one of the things I found in 2011 is that Malolos was going to be um, delisted from um, a kind of cultural heritage list in the Philippines, and as the um, flyer says, it was a group called, uh, I think, uh, Cultural Heritage uh, Preservation or Society, and so one of the vice presidents had said that, you know, in some, uh, the local government and residents were not doing a good job of preserving some of the old architecture. And the architecture that I will sort of show and discuss um, are basically what's described in architecture literature as bahay nabato. 
So these are uh, kind of a hybrid mix of indigenous aspects of architecture uh, that have been hybridized and Philippinized kind of through the period of colonization from, from Spain, right? So in the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, these particular kinds of houses that elite um, and wealthy um, you know, mestizos and Spaniards lived in, uh, there are certain cities and towns in the Philippines that still have, you know, this kind of architecture. And so this NGO was saying, well, Malolos is not doing a good job of preserving this. We're going to delist them. And so that really got my attention. Um, and uh, so that was sort of the main thing that, um, you know, I was inspired by, and then I will talk a, a little bit more about this later, but my grandmother and my mother lived in one of these houses, and so we sort of considered them an ancestral home, although, and it's kind of a mixed uh, family background, we are not of the, <laughs> the elite or super wealthy uh, class. And so I, I'll talk a little bit about how um, thinking intersectionally complicates um, this particular narrative. So due to my family history and the fact that Malolos was threatened to be delisted, uh, that pretty much sparked a project in me. And so I wrote up a grant and I received some funding from my university, uh, the University of Minnesota. And uh, so the project was funded for two years under this grant called a grant in aid of artistry and scholarship from the vice president of research at the U of M. And so that allowed me to, you know, develop this project. Um, so going to the bottom, or the second to the bottom um, bullet point, one of the things that I built into my grant was some money to um, kind of re-grant to groups in Malolos who were doing advocacy. And so there's a public education component to the project, and so my primary research partners um, is actually an academic center. Uh, so the Center for Bulacan Studies at Bulacan State University, um, I've been partnering with the director and that institution, and so some of the money from my grant they use for different um, sort of educational um, activities. Uh, so they put on a film festival, um, some writing workshops where the focus was um, having students and youth think about Malolos as a, as a site. And then they also did um, a field trip and um, exposure tour to the coastal part of Malolos. Um, and so that part was really important to me to have a community engagement piece. And so it was because of you know, this grant that we were able to do that, uh, that type of work. Uh, the, because the project is a little bit on tourism or that's another sort of vector, uh, because cultural heritage is often a way for people to promote tourism in their towns or particular locations, there is a tourism travel component. And since I've been going back to the Philippines since the 1970s, um, and I continue to kind of also reflect on my childhood and um, my adolescence and youth, and now I'm middle-aged, <laughs> um, I can actually reflect on the travel and how tourism has changed from the 70s on, right? So I remember going to the Philippines at the time that Marcos uh, was still in power and kind of what that felt like as a nine and 10 year old, right? And sort of how, what the city looked like and what Malolos looked like. Um, in the 80s, when I studied in Manila, it happened, that was 1988, so it was really only a few years after uh, the dictatorship was toppled and Corazon Aquino was in power, and so there were a lot of um, changes politically, socially, culturally, economically, and so at that particular point, uh, you know, the U.S. was still quite active in the Philippines. Um, in terms of tourism, I mean, sex tourism was a big part of what was drawing, um, quote, uh, foreigners or internationals to Manila and to other parts of the Philippines. And so in the 80s, a lot of the travelers were really Europeans and white Americans, right? Um, 
And I was one of those crazy Filipino American kids who didn't really care what my family thought to a certain extent. So I actually would go on the tourist routes, even though they thought that th I, that was really dangerous or whatever. Um, and so I have a sense of, you know, if, I, if you follow the Lonely Planet guidebook, which a lot of Europeans and Americans in the 80s did, um, I, you know, sort of followed that and went to some of the cultural heritage sites like the Rice Terraces, um, you know, Barakai when it was not, didn't even have electricity. Um, so the project kind of also allows me to reflect on tourism since in a way, I mean, I am also a tourist and a traveler because I live in the diaspora and um, so for those of us we, uh, who go back, we're kind of, um, we're in this um, multi-faceted uh, positionality, right, as Filipinos and as travelers and as migrants. So in that regard, um, that was also one of the interests. And then lastly, I'll just say that um, after the book, I started writing interdisciplinary essays that had kind of a historical and literary perspective, and I was doing close readings of places and these historical narratives and um, literary narratives. And so there was a part of me that enjoys that kind of work, and because I'm trained as an anthropologist, I also really missed doing field work and kind of getting out into the community. And so again, this project is about um, sort of balancing that. So I wanted to kind of define cultural heritage from the UNESCO perspective because um, it's, it is basically a dominant discourse, right? So thinking about what is this cultural heritage phenomenon? Uh, so basically it's ca kind of categorized into three different sites. Um, those that are sort of based on environmental or ecological significances, so natural properties that are unique and beautiful. Um, and I'll, I'll also give you examples of uh, those in the Philippines. Uh, the cultural properties, which are seen as more uh, human-made, um, so that does tend to include a lot of different architectural elements like throughout the globe and in, in many different regions. And then uh, mixed properties that have a, a little bit of both. Uh, so one of the, whoops, I think I'm ahead. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, it's actually a very new sort of discourse and policy. So basically from the mid 19th, I mean mid 20th century post World War II, uh, in 1959 UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and cultural organization organized an international appeal to save important archeological areas threatened, for example, by the proposed Aswan Dam in Egypt. Um, in 1965, there was a conference at the White House in DC that called for a World Heritage Trust that would stimulate international cooperation to protect the world's uh, superb natural and scenic areas and historic properties for the present and future of the entire world citizenry, unquote. In 1972, the World Conservation Union drew up a proposal to protect the environment, which it presented at the 1972 UN Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm. This led to drafting of the convention concerning the protection of world cultural and natural heritage, which UNESCO adopted in 1972. So this is really kind of, um, in a way, I mean, I haven't explored this uh, uh, that in-depthly, but we, I mean, I think that there is a connection also to neoliberal economics, given that this was in 1972, and so we know from, say, David Harvey's work that 1972 was a particularly important year for various economic and development policies. Uh, but nevertheless, um, since its adoption, um, 183 countries have ratified the World Heritage uh, Convention, which is basically a set of laws and policies that countries sort of agree to abide to, uh, and then there are national level policies. And so, but I think one of the issues is um, 
basically enforcement of these international treaties and um, even national uh, legislation becomes dif difficult. But at least we have a sense, if you want to look at the legalese and the legal uh, discourse that informs cultural heritage work, these would be the kinds of documents and conventions to look at. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind, and here I'm drawing from uh, this book by Augusto Villayon, uh, Philippines, Living Landscapes and Cultural Landmarks, 2005. Uh, he says that uh, by signing the World Heritage Convention, each country pledges not only to conserve the World Heritage properties within its territories, but to protect the rest of its national heritage. In other words, the focus of the convention goes beyond properties inscribed on its World Heritage list to include the heritage of each country. Um, and obviously, uh, nationalism and national heritages are... Um, are very much contested, you know, spaces, sites, and discourse, right? So I'm interested in how does this get navigated and imagined and what are the power dynamics within that, which is which is a, a theme or question that I did take up in my first book. So kind of what did uh, seafaring and global shipping mean to the Philippine state and what kinds of discourses and narratives and figures and imaginaries were used to deploy various economic development policies. So I have a little bit of that angle in terms of, you know, what's going on kind of nationally and with nationalism that promotes certain um, sites, spaces, and policies. Um, So Malolos is not on the UNESCO World Heritage Site list, but specific sections and homes are on the heritage list that's maintained by the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, NHCP, which is formerly the National Historical Institute of the Philippines. And as I discussed earlier, according to the NGO Heritage Conservation Society, the Malolos government and Malolos residents are not doing, um, in their opinion, doing an adequate job of preserving key heritage sites. I do want to say that the threat is also kind of a strategy to wake people up, right? So UNESCO also does that when they put certain properties on the threatened list. It's sort of a way to um, sometimes stop the tourism that's happening and kind of give a location a break, whether that's an environmental um, space that needs a little bit of time to, um, you know, re, uh, to heal itself, you know, ecologically. And so the threat is, uh, is real, but also could be read as a kind of advocacy strategy. Um, so there is a legal framework in the Philippines. Um, so there, they did put in this legislation, the National Cultural Heritage Act of 2009. Um, and it's a very long piece of legislation, but a, a couple of things that I wanted to point out that I think are relevant to Malolos and perhaps to um, scholars here is that uh, Section 12 does say that um, the government locally and nationally has the right to kind of designate these heritage zones, right? So there is a heritage zone in Malolos and some other cities, um, obviously, in the archipelago. Um, so there's sort of a way in which Section 13 says, the appearance of streets, parks, monuments, buildings, and natural bodies of water, canals, paths, and barangays, which is like neighborhoods or villages, within a locality shall be maintained as close to their appearance at the time the area was of most importance to Philippine history as determined by the NHI. So you can see how uh, dominant history and how, uh, you know, dominant historiography does have an important role in how heritage sites are managed, right? So the uh, understanding of who's part of the nation, how is the nation imagined, who belongs, who's out. I mean, so there is a kind of way that history really matters in cultural heritage preservation and in, in tourism. Um, I like Section 13 because of the fact that it also does uh, include 
the comment around water, right? So even within the UNESCO framework, there are also sites um, of marine heritage and ecological heritage. So, and I'll tell you that there are sites in the Philippines where the environment plays a role. And so we can see just from this that there is a way to tie cultural heritage preservation work with environmental justice work or, envi or environmental um, activism that could be um, a useful uh, point of solidarity and, and coalition building. So. I'm glad that water is mentioned because that's a key feature of the archipelago. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting, especially for scholars in the diaspora, is that the, sen the legislation also says that uh, they're trying to promote this idea of central resolves, which are these um, sites that are supposed to promote Philippine arts, culture, and languages outside throughout the world because of the fact that there are over probably now 15 million fil overseas Filipinos um, in probably now about 200 or 250 uh, countries across the globe um, through the economic and migration policies that are supported by the Philippine state. So that's also something that I talk about in my first book. And so I think that these politics have um, significances both locally, nationally in the Philippines, but obviously around the world if history and culture is being defined by these institutions and then they have uh, the means to kind of promote various um, aspects of culture and arts and language in diasporic locations. So I don't, I haven't been following whether or not these sites have actually been established, but the idea was there and uh, the politicians and advocates did uh, put it in the legislation. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the five UNESCO World Heritage Sites just to kind of let you know what they are. Uh, so the first one, um, and I'm, I sort of listed them in order of, I guess, a little bit of fame and also like what is on the international tourist path and what might be most easily accessible, right? So the first one are the rice terraces of the Cordilleras. And the uh, image I have up there uh, comes from uh, the Department of Tourism. They have um, a campaign called It's More Fun in the Philippines. And they've also done things where people have um, contributed various memes of different locations. And um, this campaign came out, I want to say, around the same time I started this project. And so I am interested in thinking through the affect and phenomenon of fun <laughs> and how that gets kind of narrated and embodied and what are the politics of fun in a country that still has um, a poverty problem um, and where people don't necessarily have access to different um, resources and traveling, right? So uh, I do want to take a critical approach to the campaign, and I, but at the same time, I also think that it has um, kind of inspired local people to promote their various sites, um, and I'll talk about how that's playing out a little bit in Malolos. So the rice terraces. Uh, the second one, which... Um, obviously has some ties uh, to, uh, to Malolos is uh, the city of Vigan, which is up in northern Luzon. So it's seen as uh, a key uh, Philippine colonial town where a lot of the architecture um, has been preserved at a um, higher rate than the architecture in uh, Malolos. And so I mean, it's very similar to old San Juan in uh, Puerto Rico, if you've ever been there with old architecture. And these are examples also of Bahay na Bato. Um, uh, Bahay is house and Bato is stone. Uh, the third, uh, which more people are visiting, uh, which is the Subterranean River National Park in Palawan. Um, I was actually there in January to kind of see what that was like. So this is about two hours away from Palawan. And what I noticed kind of 
in terms of international tourists is um, the folks I met frequently go to Boracay and then go to Palawan um, and um, also go to El Nido, right? So there's kind of a circuit among um, international travelers. Um, and the other one, the fourth, mind the fourth one, the fourth site includes four different churches in the Philippines. Um, and I need my notes for this. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll just talk it through. I think I can remember. Um, the upper left is San Agustin Church in Intramuros. And um, so that one is accessible to tourists who go to Manila and then go to Intramuros. Um, the other three, and I might, I'm probably getting them mixed up, are a variety of churches. Uh, one is in Ilocos Sur, one is in Ilocos Norte, and the other one is on the island of Panay in Iloilo. Uh, the one in Iloilo, I believe, uh, had some damage uh, when um, uh, Typhoon Yolanda went through, and so there were uh, people who were organizing to um, get funds, and I believe actually the Vatican or the Roman Catholic uh, uh, powers that be also donated to kind of maintain these churches, right? So again, it's an, an example of architectural um, preservation. And then the last one that is another is a marine heritage site is uh, the Tubataha reefs in Sulu, the Sulu Sea. Uh, so basically in the top one you'll see that the reef is in the center between Palawan and um, uh, parts of Mindanao. And that site you can't go to except if you go on a liveaboard um, diving expedition. You probably could hire um, a boatman who would take you to some of the a a atolls that are there, but it's not very accessible to most uh, Filipinos and um, travelers. So that's sort of the, the national context of cultural heritage sites. Um, and because I, I showed you different memes from the It's More Fun in the Philippines, and because I also want your feedback on this uh, discourse of fun, I wanted to show um, the video one of the things that I do want you to pay attention to is that, as you can see from, the, you'll see from the video, there are a lot of actually tourist options in the Philippines. So it's a very competitive market. And so I think that's also one of the challenges that Malolos has in terms of this audience. And, and I do think that the tourism and cultural heritage tourism um, is more probably targeting local Filipinos or diasporic Filipinos who care about national history and um, the revolution against Spain and that sort of thing. But again, to kind of paint a picture of what's the national context for tourism in the Philippines.
the things that um, my reason, one of the folks that I did an interview with, um, and also I, I'm going to tell you about the historical preservation, but um, one of the things that's going Manila on is, is actually Bulacan. four cities stuck together to make up the world's most densely populated mega city. Joined together by a huge clogged up multi lane highway. <laughs> So in Bulacan province, which <coughs> is where Malolos is found, it's slightly um, inland, so it doesn't have you know these fabulous beaches that you saw. And so one of the cultural heritage advocates told me that um, because they've developed all these sort of water parks and water resorts in Bulacan, right, because it's, it's hot and so people need a place to cool off, that people, like even the, the school kids who maybe go to some of these historical sites are kind of like, okay, when is this done? Like, we want to go swimming, right? And so the idea of fun also kind of detracts from the historical um, cultural heritage work, um, and even within the local population. It's something that they uh, want to pay attention to, but there are also lots of other um, opportunities um, and things to check out, both in Bulacan and in Malolos. Um, so in case you don't know kind of where it is, this is a, a map of Bulacan and also in relation to Manila. Uh, so. Uh, it is very close to Manila. It's um, 45 kilometers or about 30 miles north, uh, uh, northwest of the city, the Metro Manila. And so one of the things that's happening is that there's a kind of mega region phenomenon that's happening. Uh, so just north on the, on the national map, um, in Angeles, right, there's an airport there. Um, and also Subic is across the way. And so basically the government's trying to link up the infrastructure that's actually needed for globalization and to become an even more global city. So Manila is eating up all of these other locations. And so that's one of the things that's happening in Malolo. So for example, um, uh, the train line is getting extended all the way to Malolos. And so in a way it's going to become a suburb or if it's already a suburb of Manila, um, even though it does have, um, you know, a long history of being an independent um, town and location in and of itself. Um, so I don't think you can read all of these, but basically that's Malolos. And um, the significant thing I just want you to pay attention to in the right hand map, you'll see kind of the town center and the barrios in that location. So you see San Vicente, San Juan, Santo Nino, uh, San Agustin. Um, Basically, when the town developed and um, when the Spaniards took over, they implemented a, a Spanish town um, uh, planning style, right? So it starts from the church and it radiates out. Uh, they also, at the time, wanted Chinese people to stay close to the church as a way to kind of manage the Chinese population. If you notice, the other barrios actually have indigenous Tagalog names. So Tikai, a kind of tree, Matimbo is a, a place where a lot of um, bamboo grasses grow. And so from this and um, riffing off some other scholars who are looking at Pampanga, if you look at place names in these towns, you can see obviously where um, indigeneity was thriving and that it, you know, we have a history that is longer than um, you know, colonial contact. And so to kind of explore how these places develop because of that. And so the heritage site um, within Malolos is in the more Spanish um, parts of the city if you think about the layers of um, town development, right? And so that's just something um, to think about like the politics of the space. Um, I want to talk about Baraswain Church because that is one of, it's probably the most famous site in Malolos. So it's actually on the 10 uh, peso bill in the Philippines. And um, the reason for that is three major historical events happened at the church. The first Philippine Congress met there. 
Uh, the Malolos Constitution was drafted there, and the first Philippine Republic was established there, which was the first of its kind in Asia in 1898, right? So whenever I tell people, oh, I'm from Malolos, I just usually say it's kind of like the Philadelphia of the United of of the Philippines, right? So. If you've been to Philadelphia, you know uh, the, these various sites where the first Congress met um, when, uh, you know, quote, Americans were fighting the British and so on. And so it's that kind of town, that kind of similar history. Um, one of the ways that I read the church is it is a kind of metonym um, in terms of... Um, it, so it's a metonym for the nation, right, because of these events... Um, happening there and also because it was a church and the ways that there's a kind of religious element often really infused in Filipino politics, um, people go there as a kind of uh, pilgrimage both to the nation and to Catholicism. So while I was doing my field work, one of the things I did was just hang out at the church for hours on end. And a key um, person who I hung out with was actually this balloon vendor, a very um, old woman who was in her um, 80s, um, I want to say 80s, perhaps 90s, but she had been selling balloons for 60 years and had lived across the way in one of the barrios there and really hadn't left that area. I mean, and now she's very frail and can really only walk from her house to the church. But this is her livelihood. And so we talked a lot about how people would come there and kind of take a selfie um, tour buses of school kids going there. And so it is um, a key site and one of the reasons that Malolos is sort of on the historical and on the local tourism map. Um, in August 1st, 1973, the president cum dictator Ferdinand Marcos, through presidential decree number 260, made Barasuen Church a national historical shrine. So, for example, when um, Joseph Estrada was inaugurated, his inauguration happened at Barasuen because it was also the commemoration of the nation, um, so that was uh, 1998 and then 1898 for the original republic, and so they went to the church. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Aquinos and their connection to Malolos. Uh, so president, the current president, um, uh, Nino Aquino, has given speeches at this church. So again, it's kind of a site of spirituality and the nation. Um, Okay, the next thing I want to show is, so this is the city of Malolos' uh, website, and you can see how they are riffing off of the It's More Fun in the Philippines campaign. So down below in Tagalog, it says, Iba ang saya dito. So the fun is different here. And um, you can see the way that they're riffing also with vegan, right? Vamos a Malolos. It's, uh, evoking its Hispanic sort of um, history and um, similarity between vegan. Um, if you go to the tourism where to go site, uh, you can see, so I just want you to see how the city itself is presenting itself. So Baraswain Church, going to Casa Real, uh, which is a, an example of Baha'i Nabato, but also has this uh, very palimpsestic history with uh, Japanese colonialism. It was used as a um, you know, post office, et cetera. Uh, this famous tree where Aguinaldo was, um, another church, and then the Jose Conhuanco mansion. Uh, Jose, uh, Jose Conhuanco is the uh, father, of course, on Aquino, and I'll talk about that house uh, momentarily. Um, another Baha'i Nabato or mansion. And then here you see existing old houses. So you see that architecture is a feature, and these houses are very much in uh, the barrio of, um, officially it's called Santo Nino, but its other name is Camistisuhan, which means where the mestizos live, right? And so uh, Malolos wealth was generated through the sugar industry, actually prior to sugar developing in Negros, 
Um, so people don't often associate sugar with um, central Luzon, but uh, it was happening um, in the 18th and 19th century. Um, okay. <laughs> I know I'm starting to run out of time. Um, the other thing, again, this is how is the city promoting itself? If you go to where to eat, because Filipinos, we need our food, um, you see that it's all very much kind of corporate <coughs> chains, right? So did you catch that? Uh, McDonald's, Jollibee's, Red Ribbon, whoops, Chow King, right? So these are sort of the places that are being promoted by the city of Malolos. And then also, as it mentioned, the ancestral houses. Um, so I want to go to the ancestral house. Um, I forgot to. So as an example of the kind of cultural heritage preservation, I want to mention the Women of Malolos Foundation. So the Women of Malolos were the um, mestiza, a lot of Chinese mestiza women during Jose Rizal's time who protested and uh, demanded educational reform that would allow women to get um, an education, right? So this was a kind of proto-feminist or feminist um, uh, activism at the time, and so that's what it refers to, the women of Malolos. And Jose Rizal wrote a famous letter to these women, kind of um, writing in solidarity. So one of these, uh, the NGO's projects was to renovate one of the Baha'i Nabatoa, which is owned by uh, an ancestor of the original women of Malolos, right? And so they fundraised and uh, they redid the house. Um, and let's see. Okay, I've talked about that. So, uh, one of the things that you'll note just from the fact that it is an original, okay. Oh my gosh, one of the things that it is an original sort of house um, is the fact that um, it is a private um, building, right? So a key, I'll just go quickly to the problems. So due to the fact it being um, an ancestral home, these are privately owned, so the city can't actually enforce and tell people what to do with their homes. So if you get an NGO that wants to work with the homeowner or the family that owns the house, then they can renovate it. There is minimal regulation. Uh, the former president of the Women of Malolos Foundation, one of the things she says is that because of my internal migration in the Philippines, so like people moving from the countryside to the urban um, areas for, for work, a lot of the people in Malolos, uh, she said, Sani Reyes said, that they're not from there, so they don't know the history, they're not necessarily connected, so that was one of the um, ways that this is happening. Um, absentee landlords, right, so people have out-migrated either to the United States, other places, or to Manila. Um, I talked about the mega region. Uh, there's poverty there, <laughs> um, still there. Uh, the other thing is even if people have money and wanted to buy a house, there is more of the rise of subdivisions. And so even though historically being at, near the center of town is, was seen as a more prestigious location, um, people don't necessarily want to buy properties in that area. They'd rather be in a gated community. So that prevents some of the preservation work that's happening. Um, there is also a way in which uh, working class people or poor people can't relate to this project because these are elite histories, elite people who own these homes. And so um, one of the slides that I don't have time to sh show is, um, so during my field work, I, I went there after one of the major floods that happened in August of 2012, and I was talking to a tricycle driver who told me that he hadn't worked for four days because of the flood, and that now he has to try to, you know, fix up his house 
house. And so it just, it was an obvious case of why would folks care or participate in cultural heritage work when it's about, you know, rebuilding um, a wealthy person's home where, where working and poor people are just managing and given the things around climate change. Um, I will just close, um, and I can talk about my family history later. This is, I think, more important. Um, I think in terms of some recommendations after being there and reflecting on what's going on, I do think that um, the cultural heritage movement think, needs to think more intersectionally in order to kind of be able to bring in more people into the movement, right? And I think, um, uh, thinking intergenerationally would be helpful and having a more dynamic understanding of history and culture. Um, I'm going really fast. Uh, connecting land and literal spaces of where the coastal areas are, thinking about indigeneity. Um, and an example that I have that comes from my field work is uh, so this is a, a magazine that somebody just put out. And you have to understand, like, these kind of glossy magazines did not exist in Malolos, like, even 10 years ago, right? That there is a kind of different sensibility, a global cosmopolitan sensibility. Um, and so if you look at sort of the contents of it, it has a youth perspective. I mean, just look at the art. And also thinking about that particular jeepney is the kind of jeepney that is special to Malolos. And so youth and younger people, they care about the historical aspects and the preservation. And if you look on the front cover, like it said, one of the bullet points is ancestral homes. So they do care about it, but that's not something that is going to be their main sort of uh, focus. So this is a shot also within the magazine of the public market, which is also a public and working class space. Um, they're promoting local um, foods that are made, not corporate. Um, uh, this is more, they're interested in working class culture. So this is a sign maker who makes the signs for the jeepneys. And again, the, the folks who drive the jeepneys are very much working class um, and poor people, right? And they're also trying to stress the coastal areas which have an indigenous uh, component, not just the Hispanicized uh, Philippine or Chinese aspect of Malolos um, identity. And, you know, fishing also is a working class. Um, they're some of the poorest folks in many uh, Filipino communities. And again, trying to, so if we link this broader perspective on what constitutes both the nation and the city, I think we will be able to build different kinds of solidarity and bring more people towards what we might think of as cultural heritage work, but is really also social justice work. Um, and so that's kind of where my, my project is, is moving me towards. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions, feedback? Sides. You know, the, the churches do okay because there many of them are still churches, and so there there's lots of people attending. I've been to Rizal's house, I've been to museums, and by and large, the museums and the ancestral homes are, are pretty empty. And so I wondered, from your experience in Malolos, who who seems to be taking responsibility for these places? I mean, it's not the national government, right? It relies on this age-old idea of taking this party out of selfishly, or are they leading it to Malolos as a city to take care of it? Right. Well, this is where the idea of it's private property, right? And so, um, like for example, this is a Baha'i Nabato that um, it's literally, this is actually where my grandmother and my mother um, lived. Uh, so I told you Jose Conhuanco is the mother of Corazon Aquino. Uh, Conhuanco married Tecla Chichoco and uh, my mother's side were Chichocos. And so Tecla's brother, Marcelino, um, is my great-grandfather. The Conhuancos moved to Tarlac, right? So you have an, an example of, it was my poor grandmother who was the caretaker of the house. So it's an example of people migrating 
they, they migrated to Tarlac and obviously to other parts of the world. Um, and now they, it's closed. So you would think that this very important house, um, even just in relation to the Aquino family, not necessarily to my family, um, would be open to the public. And one of the things that happened in this house is that when Nino Aquino was assassinated, his body was uh, displayed and the wake happened here and they brought his body back to Malolos, right? And so it's a very kind of historically rich house. So one of the things that's also interesting is how, uh, because you know generations kind of just continue, those distant now cousins of mine don't know who I am and we don't know each other and nobody knows actually the story of this house to a certain degree. And also you can see how the patriarchal element, this actually was Chichoco land, uh, but then kind of gets narrated as a, the Conwanko mansion. And so uh, the maternal line, which is also my line, doesn't necessarily get addressed, right? So these are some of the problems with the, the preservation of other homes is also when there are dynamics within families of who inherited, who inherits a property and then how do they want to use that space. Um, and then so often there might be a caretaker who's you know some kind of distant relative, but it's closed. As you're saying, is there, it's not open, it's not being renovated, but then people also don't want to sell because there's such a nostalgic ancestral connection, right? So my mother actually asked the Kongwankos if they wanted to sell because my mother wanted the house, and they said no. Um, and so I think this is not just happening to our family, but to other families. Okay. Um, so I was just curious, if you go back to the, the Glossy magazine, Okay. Um, I was curious, who's producing that, who's reading it, um, and then how does that play into some of the broader politics of, of you know, who, who is being envisioned as, as a potential support? Because in some ways, this is closer to the, to the, the flashy video you showed, you showed earlier than, than, than the, the website, right, the, the local Molos website, right? In some ways, the aesthetic is much similar, much the same as that, right? Right. That's a great question. I think in one of my slides I had the name for the managing editor, but it's a, a woman and I did not have a chance to talk with her, interview her, but I did speak with uh, one of the contributors and I think he was in charge of marketing. So um, he, this young man who's actually part of the palace's media corps, so he works for the president now, um, and I think he commutes back and forth between Malolos and um, Malacanang. And so, anyways, he owns a little boutique in downtown Malolos where they sell different T-shirts. It's kind of very hipster in a way. Um, but so these folks, like that's sort of their project, right? So if you see on the banner, fashion, culture, heritage, they sell various kinds of T-shirts that have Philippine um, patriots like Marcelo del Pilar is from, Malo is from Malolos or Bulacan. Um, and so I think they are trying to reach out to a Manila audience, right? So that kind of hip, young uh, Manileños who only have to take a 30 minute draw, you know, sort of trying to draw that in. And I do think that um, folks in the diaspora, like in terms of them, of them accessing a kind of global youth perspective um, is another area. And I think also the way that hip hop culture, um, you know, demands that people quote represent like where they're from like that kind of attitude it has been infused like within the local youth culture. So it's sort of like, yes, we need a certain pride of let's represent Malolos, right? Last question, I think, or one.
Yes. So the owner of that shop, I think, is in his 30s, and obviously he's very media savvy. I mean, he works for the president. Yes, Victor. I know that um, you were mentioning last night that CNN contacted you, and I was wondering if you could speak to why they were interested in talking to you at all. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So I think in one of the points that I talked about, like, without migration, is that you know, and I'm sure many of you are aware, there has been a brain drain, right? And we don't actually use that term very much anymore, but the brain drain was something that people talked about in the 80s, like with the out-migration. And so you have people who are educated, um, trained in a variety of fields, and then they leave, right? So my parents are of that generation, like post-1965. I mean, they were teachers, my dad was an engineer, and that, that, that really reflects many, many other family histories. Um, so one aspect of the brain drain is that there was actually a Maloleno who, somebody from Michigan sent the flyer of this talk to him, and he is the Beijing bureau chief who then friended me. And I'm like, who is this guy? And then it, I come to find out he is, he's a Maloleño and he's the student of my parents, right? And so it, I think it's just an example. And I'm not saying that there aren't talented, educa educated people in Malolos because clearly the the folks who are writing this magazine and producing it like there are amazing amazing people who who have chosen to stay in the archipelago for a variety of reasons um, and I don't want to connect that binary but I or um, stress that binary but I do want to underscore that a brain drain has happened and so when you have people and resources and thinking and cultural production leaving, there's, it, it, you know, creates a strain on a place, right? And we see this locally in the United States when, when you know, young people want to leave their small towns and go to the city. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily um, something unique to the Philippines. But I think that hearing from the bureau chief of CNN really underscored that point for me is here's this very talented, ambitious, qualified person who no longer lives in the area to kind of help this movement. But he is very, he was interested in, you know, my project. And so I was grateful that we met. And so maybe we can also, you know, collaborate on some other things um, in the future. Thank you so much.